Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I was going to take a minute just to introduce myself. Um, you guys are really spread out. you got to kind of do a panorama here to see you all, but uh, that's okay. I'll make do. Um, but yeah, I just want to give you a little brief introduction, just uh, so you know who I am. My name's Tim, Tim Hart. Um, I live on Quadra Island here. I've been here for a year and a half, and uh, I'm actually one of the Mounties here, so I work with the RCMP, and I'm, uh, I'm posted here, so i um, not sure when the last time an RCMP member spoke here, probably a long time ago. <laughs> it's probably the guy who was also like the post guy and the doctor, like back in the early, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the RCB has funny history, you know, back in the day they used to be the fire chief and the post delivery guy and the doctor and the pastor and everything, so the one guy in town. Some interesting history. Anyway, um, yeah, really, really love being here. It's a joy to be here. And uh, my wife and I, and I have three kids, we all uh, live here, and so uh, my wife's name is Shauna. Uh, she's not with me this morning. She's actually the worship director at one of the churches in Campbell River. It's where we attend as a family, uh, the Gateway Foursquare Church. Uh, so, anyway, I'm hoping she'll come visit here one of these days, but, and I've got three kids, uh, Noah, Josiah, and Isabella, They're, Noah's turning 17 here shortly, and then Joe's 15, and uh, Izzy is 13, so they're, they're good kids, they're fun, they're handful, and they're all musicians, so my house is, never has a moment of uh, peace and quiet, there's always drums and guitars and pianos at all times, so, um, but it's good, they, they, they do a lot of uh, praise and worship type stuff, and so... Anyway, that's a little bit of an intro to me, so nice to meet you guys. I said hello to some of you. Uh, so this morning, I want to actually take a look. I was, you know, I was praying into um, what to speak on, and there's just been this, uh, this passage that's really been heavy on my heart, uh, I would say, not, even just for the last several months, and it's this, uh, I think it's actually a really challenging portion of Scripture. And in fact, I'd argue that maybe one, it's one of the more challenging chapters of all the Gospels. Like when you read this chapter, it's got some weighty, challenging statements that Jesus makes. And so if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 14. We're going to take a look at a parable of Jesus. Jesus here. And uh, give you a moment. If you don't have a paper Bible, there may be some here. I don't know if there is. Uh, or obviously, if you know, if you're digital, if you're millennial like me, you can use your phone and use a Bible app and things like that. Um, so Luke chapter 14. So just before we get into this parable, the parable I want to look at is actually uh, the parable of the great banquet. It's going to be verses 12 through to 24 is a section I kind of want to zero in on this morning. Uh, just before we do that, though, I want to take a look at, uh, a little bit at the setting, what's going on here, Luke chapter uh, 14. So at the very beginning, very first verse, it actually says it's one Sabbath that Jesus went in to dine at the house of uh, a ruler of the Pharisees. And look at this. It says they were watching him carefully. Uh, sorry, before I go, I'm going to take a look at that clock and figure out how long, because I'm one of those guys that needs to try hard not to uh, go too long. So, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm good. Sorry about that. Uh, all right. Uh, so, here we have one Sabbath that Jesus is actually dining at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. And so, he's invited to this sort of probably like a luncheon or a banquet of some kind. And there's other Pharisees here. And interestingly, it says they were watching him carefully. So, it kind of sets the stage of what's going on. These Pharisees have invited Jesus. And it's actually really clear from the passage that the whole thing is intended to be a trap to sort of catch him. And and the reason being is, I think it connects to the previous chapter. If you read Luke 13, uh, it was probably the previous Sabbath or one shortly uh, beforehand, where Jesus was in a synagogue, and there was a woman who had a disabling spirit. And he, he came up to her, he said, woman, you are set free of your infirmity, and he healed her on the Sabbath. Well, the synagogue ruler became indignant because, you know, in, in the minds of the Pharisees, that, that was to do work on the Sabbath, that was to break the Sabbath. And so, you know, they felt that Jesus couldn't be from God, he's not keeping the Sabbath, and they became indignant. And so, uh, it sounds to me like perhaps word has gotten around with the Pharisees, you know, that Jesus is out there, but he's, he's not keeping the commands of God. He's breaking the Sabbath. And so, we, here we have an, a lunch organized with probably one of the, it says the ruler of the Pharisees, so probably somebody of prominence among that community who kind of wants to see, okay, is this really true? Are we going to catch Jesus in the act? And interestingly, there's a man, it says, who's present, uh, who actually has... Uh, Dropsy. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, but it's. But look at this. He says. Um, oh, sorry. It, it says there's a man present, and he had 
drop C. Now, if, if you don't know what drop C is, it's another term for it. It's called edema. It's basically this idea where you retain fluid in, in your body, and there's, you know, you're usually in your ankles and your feet. It's this kind of excessive fluid in the body's tissues and this kind of swelling up that happens. And so um, that's what's going on here. There's a man with, with this condition, edema or dropsy. And then it says, um, uh, Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, and he says this question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Uh, but they remained silent. So he took the man, he healed him, and sent him away. And then he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So here's this a bit of the stage. So you have this luncheon going on, you have the, these Pharisees that are trying to catch Jesus in sort of this trap. And actually his discourse with them is very similar to the previous chapter. You know, in the, when he's in the synagogue and he says, which of you has a donkey will not untie it on the Sabbath and lead it to water? And he's just sort of a appealing to some of the religious customs which have actually gotten so far as to neglect the, the wellness of people and kind of putting things out of priority. Well, uh, so that's the setting. The next part here, this, this kind of interesting thing happens where Jesus then begins to notice that the Pharisees, how they're choosing places of honor and they're sitting in, you know, they're being very mindful of who gets to sit where and where these places of honor are. And so Jesus actually, is thr- throughout this, is on a couple of cases, he sort of begins to attack these kind of false religious um, ideas, this false religious confidence that the Pharisees have. You know, as they sit down in, they start to sit in, in uh, these places of honor and so on, Jesus tells them, he says, um, uh, when you are invited by someone to the wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited. And he who invited uh, you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame uh, to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may see you and say, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus is sort of identifying that there is this uh, this spiritual pride, there's a spiritual elitism, there's this overconfidence in these religious, in in kind of the religious zeal of the Pharisees. Um, One little interesting piece of history, actually, I looked into this, uh, according to Jewish tradition, actually the Pharisees, interestingly, uh, one one of the things that characterized that group was that they believed very strongly... Uh, their, their desire was to see the Messiah return, and they believed that the Messiah w- would not return if if the nation of Israel, you know, failed to keep the law and failed to honor the Sabbath. And in fact, one of their highest priorities, one of the laws that they would have uh, exalted probably above other laws, would be to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And in fact, I I, I read that uh, actually in Israel's history, there was the Pharisees believed that if they could get the entire nation of Israel to keep the Sabbath for two consecutive Sabbaths that that would be enough to bring the Messiah back. So it kind of gives a little bit of a glimpse into why these guys are so zealous for these religious customs, religious traditions, but particularly around the Sabbath, because you probably notice that a lot of times, a lot of the offenses and things is around this topic of uh, the Sabbath with Jesus. I don't know if you noticed that in the Gospels at all, but... Just a little bit of a background. Uh, so, so Jesus in this feast, he he he's, uh, he starts to address some of the the fall, the fallacy of you know the fact that their customs and their traditions are now getting in the way of actually helping people and giving life to people. He's dealing with the fact that there's some spiritual pride, there's some elitism. Well, now here's it, it's interesting. Uh, he goes into this parable, and I want to start in verse twelve. He starts it this way. He says. Um, he, he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just." So there's a Pharisee sitting around the table, and someone says, one of the Pharisees who's present, he says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. 
So interesting, Jesus setting the stage here of addressing some of these issues with the Pharisees. Now, if somebody hears what Jesus says and kind of responds, and now there's some dispute here. Some people think that maybe this would be somebody who would uh, have accepted the teachings of Jesus or uh, might have heard him or might have heard some of his uh, Sermon on the Mount or things and, and would kind of uh, give credence to the teaching of Jesus, you know, and kind of maybe someone like Nicodemus or someone like that. Um, or it could be that, you know, someone here is is speaking that sort of like in sincerely it's kind of really difficult to tell from the passage what kind of the what was meant by that guy who spoke up but Jesus uses his comment to then go into this next parable and so uh, let's take a look at this Uh, he said uh, there once was a man who gave a great banquet and he invited many and at the time of the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited come For everything is now ready. That was verse uh, 16 and 17. And so, uh, so I'm just going to flip down here a bit. So first of all, the Bible is describing this event as a great banquet. All right? So it's not like a couple people come over for dinner. This is like a great banquet and there's many invited. So that would suggest that this would be a banquet that is being uh, put on by somebody who's quite wealthy, probably. How many of you guys have seen The Count of Monte Cristo? Anyone seen that movie? Okay, yeah. So you remember, you know, if you don't know the story, there's a guy who gets betrayed. He gets thrown in jail wrongly. He meets a guy in jail who kind of knows where this treasure is. He eventually breaks out of jail. He finds this treasure. And to get revenge on his enemies, he actually be, he becomes the Count of Monte Cristo. He becomes this, he gets all this money, so he buys a big uh, mansion. And, he, and then he throws this banquet. And he sends out these extremely elegant invitations. And they're sent to all the people of prominence, all the people that are in these political positions or the wealthy. And, you know, so you see these kind of dignity and these wealthy people getting these invitations and they're like smelling it, there's perfume on it and it's, uh, you know, it's just, it would have been an excitement because in this time of history, uh, something like this, this great banquet would actually have been probably the pinnacle of, uh, of social society. This is probably one of the greatest things that could happen in a, as, as a social setting and it would be probably quite an honor to be invited to the banquet of a very wealthy man. And so, but, but do you notice this? It says, it says that... Um, uh, at the time, or sorry, um, it said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and he invited many. And then it says, at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. And so as I studied this this week, I actually learned something interesting. In the ancient world, it wasn't like if we were going to throw a banquet or we're going to have a wedding, you know, you and I probably go to Costco. We buy a bunch of stuff in bulk. We get, maybe even buy an extra chest freezer. You load it all up. Like very easy for us. Back in the ancient world, they didn't have Costco. They didn't have uh, freezers or food storage was difficult. So to prepare a banquet, let alone a large, significant banquet, it usually meant acquiring animals, slaughtering animals, uh, cleaning animals, preparing meat, acquiring vegetables and spices and oils. and like There's quite a lot of effort and work that would go into that. And again, not quite as easy as just drive down to Costco or over to Superstore. Like these things, you had to go and find guys and buy cattle from them. And I only got three I can do. Okay, we got to find someone else. So it would have been quite an endeavor to prepare for such a banquet and such a feast. And so usually in the ancient world, there were always two invitations given. They would give the first invitation, and that was to let you all know that a banquet is coming. You know, the invitation would go out, though there's going to be a great banquet hosted by so-and-so, and and it'll be coming up soon. Just kind of be ready. But there would be no date, because you can't really plan on a date. That'd be very difficult. And so what would happen then, once you get the first invitation, everybody would respond and say, oh yes, I'd be delighted to come, but you'd have to now wait for a second invitation, the second message uh, from uh, from a servant who would come out to say, okay, now the preparations are ready, that like it's ready, come on to the banquet. And so that's kind of why it says here, you kind of get this idea, there's these two invitations. Okay, and so he says, uh, at the time of the banquet, the servant went out and he said to those who had already been invited, now come for everything is now ready. But, and now this is, by the way, where the, ter- where the parable is going to take a massive turn and would have been kind of utterly preposterous to a Jewish listener. Uh, utterly ridiculous what Jesus goes on to describe as happening next, right? So look at this. It says, um, come for now, everything's ready. Verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. For the first said to him, I have bought a field 
and I must go out to see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I, I, I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant reported these things to his master. So here's why this is so ridiculous, because again, think of the nature of a banquet like this, a very wealthy man, the pinnacle of social society. You've got this probably a, quite an elegant, honored invitation, and all of a sudden you have a guy who bought a field or something, and he has to go check it out. You know, like, I mean, first of all, he already bought the field. It's kind of interesting, like, did he not go look at it before he bought it? You know, you and I typically don't buy uh, properties sight unseen. I did that, well, I rented a place once like that, and it actually worked out, but I wouldn't recommend it. You want to go there. You want to see it before you buy it. So you have this man who's now got this invitation, which everyone has been living potentially for days or even weeks in this excited anticipation for this great banquet of this, in this distinguished honor to be welcomed as a guest. And now all of a sudden I have to go and just see like if we need to get the lawn care guy in there or whatever, or get a surveyor to put some pegs down. Like it just seems like, could that not wait till tomorrow or the next day? It was a very odd reason not to come. Well, look at the next guy. He says, I have five yoke of oxen. So I would suggest somebody pretty wealthy. Uh, oxen were considered the premier animal of the ancient Jewish world. They were the animals that did all the work and all the labor, and they're pretty valuable. But yet, this guy had bought them already, and he says, I have to go examine them. So I have to go examine my oxen. In other words, I can't come to this banquet because I've got to go to the barn and just kind of, you know, look at it in its mouth, make sure there's any cavities or whatever. Like, there's this very strange and, to be honest, very flimsy and ridiculous ridiculous and outlandish reasons why these people are declining to come to this extremely distinguished honor to be invited to this banquet. I, the last guy, he says he got married and his wife wouldn't let him go, okay, maybe that, that one might be okay. Maybe, you know, <laughs> I understand where he's coming from. If your wife doesn't let you go, happy wife, happy life, you know, that could be. Uh, but anyway, the point of the parable is that n- this would never happen in, in the ancient world. This, this simply just would never, ever be the response of these people. It would be like the thing they would look forward to in the year or even in the decade. And to to turn it down for these flimsy, uh, lame excuses uh, would have actually probably been quite shocking and quite outlandish to Jesus' listeners. And so then look what happens next in the parable. It says, uh, the master, so the servant came and reported these things to the master. This is verse 21. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to his servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. So here's what happens. The the wealthy refuse to come. Now, interestingly, they actually said yes at the first invitation. But when the time came and the preparations were made and that second invitation, letting them know everything was ready, it was at that point where these different worldly people kind of seemingly insignificant, unimportant things actually began to get in the way, and they didn't come. So what happens then? The servants go out, and they find who? The poor, the blind, the lame. Now, what's really interesting about this is that these people would never have been invited to a banquet like this in in that time. You wouldn't invite the, the, the dirty people who, you know, wearing the same clothes for weeks and they smell and they're homeless, they're, they're crippled, they're la- like these were kind of considered the lowest of the low in society and not the kind of people you would expect to see at this elegant banquet of a wealthy person. And yet the master says to the servants, go and bring these ones in. And his banquet, the the master's banquet is filled with these people that are the marginalized of society, the people that, the most unsuspecting of, of, uh, of guests. And then he says, there's still room. There's this other part where then they go into the, the highways and the hedges and they compel, compel people to come in. Well, that's interesting. So here, here's why the, com- the, com- the compelling is required. Because if you went out and tried to invite somebody like that to this banquet, it's very unlikely they would come. They would think, I, I have no place being in a, in a place like that. that you know, I, I, I don't deserve to be there. I'm not the kind of person that, that you know, there would probably be all kinds of reasons why that person would feel completely unqualified and uninvited. And yet, 
the, the, what it is, is it's a compelling. It's like that word actually means to force, to urge, to compel, to constrain. It's that kind of language to bring these people in. And so we get this incredible parable. So what, what, is actually, what is Jesus saying here in the context? Well, first and foremost, I think that he's speaking firstly and foremostly to Israel. And he's addressing Israel's rejection of the Messiah is what's going on. The setting is that we have a bunch of Pharisees. We have people who are choosing the honored seats. We have people who, who are, are trusting in their own religious piety, in, in their own, uh, they have this, this misguided and misplaced religious confidence that because they keep all these laws and these traditions that they've earned righteousness, that they have righteousness. You know, but Jesus says something fascinating. Uh, he says, there's a verse in Matthew 23, um, it says, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 23. He says, um, the teacher of the, uh, of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they, pra- for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So you have these Pharisees that come up with these traditions and these religious requirements that they heap on people as these burdens they themselves not even living up to. And so you have that these people that in their own sense of righteousness and religious piety, that that isn't enough to get them a seat at the, the banqueting table, but it is actually the poor. It's actually the humble, the broken, the rejected of society that find themselves at the banqueting table of God. And so this, this passage is firstly and foremostly a warning to the religious. In that time, uh, Jesus is basically saying, you know, if you, if you consider the first invitation, the second invitation of the banquet, the first invita- invitation would be a lot like the, the, re- the religious leaders in, in Israel who heard the prophets, who heard Daniel and who listened to David and, and Isaiah and the coming of the Messiah and the realization of the kingdom of God and Daniel 7, the Davidic covenant, those kinds of things. They, would, they actually accepted these things. They accepted the, the law of Moses and the word of God. They accepted the prophets and, and, and the these ideas of the coming, the coming Messiah and the coming kingdom. That's just kind of a bit of the resembling the first invitation. Well, what's the second invitation is actually now Jesus showing up kind of in, you know, like, like the servant and going out saying, you know, as Jesus proclaims the gospel and he proclaims that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is now here. It's now upon you. The preparations are made kind of represents that second invitation. And it's at that time where these religious leaders of Israel began to have the wrong wrong priorities and the wrong confidence and they actually missed who Jesus was and they didn't respond to his invitation. But look, look at the people that Jesus tended to minister to. You know, in Matthew 9, I think it's in verse 35, there's a really interesting scene where Jesus had been doing some uh, healings and he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead and he cast out some evil spirits from two men in the Gadarenes. And, and at the end of the chapter, there are a crowd of people and Jesus looks at them and it says they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And it says he had compassion on them. You know, and you see Jesus in another scene, uh, I think it's in Luke 5, where he is, um, sorry, I didn't organize my notes very good. I'm jumping around a bit. Well, there's another scene where Jesus is, at, in Luke 5, he is, um, uh, sorry, let me just scroll down here. My apologies. So, the Pharisees and scribes, they grumbled at his disciples. Sorry, this is Luke 5, verse 30 to 32. And they said, uh, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So you get this idea that the ministry of Jesus, like Jesus, you often find him with some of the, the most rejected people of society, among the widows. You know, when he raises the widow's son at Nain, or, you know, blind Bartimaeus, he's with the blind, he's with the crippled, and with the lame. And it's Jesus went to those people, and it's often those people that responded to his invitation. You know, and so you get this picture that, um, that it's, it kind of becomes clear, this sort of upside-down principle of the kingdom of heaven, that it's, it's those 
those that are that are are righteous, that those who feel like they have put it together don't really feel this humility or this need of God or an awareness of their sin, that they actually find a reason not to respond. And yet it's the it's the poor and it's the broken that then respond. And in fact, we're called to go to compel them. You know, so the second invitation kind of is represented by Jesus and the, the message of Jesus, the message of the gospel and the apostles. And so, number one, it's, it's a warning. It's a warning to the religious. You, you're not getting into this banquet on your own religious merit, on your own religious zeal. Uh, but it actually takes a humility. It takes becoming, it be, becoming lowly and, and becoming, you know, humbled, being aware of your humble estate. And this is not necessarily saying that you have to be physically poor. I mean, some of us who, who make a good income are like, oh, shoot, does that mean, uh, you know, am I in trouble here of getting in the door? It's not necessarily, it's, but, you know, when Jesus in the, in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's, all of us actually have a spiritual poverty. You know, all of us experience a spiritual bankruptness, and we're all in need of salvation. And, you know, sometimes it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our sinful nature, to humble us, to make us aware that we are actually helplessly lost and in need of salvation that brings us to that place of being poor in spirit. It, that then you could actually respond to the invitation of God, but it's when, but it's when there's this pride, when there's this, I, which is Jesus said, it's difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. When someone is flushed with material possessions and caught up in the cares of the world, it becomes very hard to say yes to the invitation of God. So number two, I think there there is very much an invitation here, and I don't know where everybody's at in this room, uh, but you need to know that Jesus gives an invitation. If you're somebody who has never responded to that invitation, you know Jesus makes it really clear that you're, you're, he does he's not looking for the righteous and the people put together to welcome him into his kingdom, but he actually is so moved in compassion to the hurting and the broken and the poor, and there's nobody disqualified from this invitation into God's kingdom. And so if you're somebody who has never responded to Jesus and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I would love to pray with you. I know um, Murray or others in the church to find someone to pray with you. And there is a moment this morning where you can respond to Jesus and say, Lord, I thank you that, that you have died on the cross for me, that you laid down your life for me, and that you give me this invitation to come into your kingdom. Well, lastly, I think there's a mission stated here for you and I as believers. And this is the part that I kind of felt the most burning about. Um, I wanted to look at another passage, but I don't think for time we'll be able to. But what I want to say is this, you know, um, Jesus begins the parable and he bas- and he gives this, he gives this instruction. He says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You know, and as I was praying earlier this morning, I was saying, you know, as the church, we're called to be the light of the world. And we're called to be a lamp, not put under a basket, but put on a stand so that it gives light to all who are in the house. And I know that we as Christians sometimes struggle to get out from under the lamp. <laughs> do, do you agree with me? Sometimes, you know, we find ourselves, that I've, I've, so many years I've been in church, and it's like Christians were very comfortable to show up to Bible studies with other Christians or worship nights or prayer nights. And those are all very good things. But sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've looked back over long periods of my life and have just saying, wow, where did I ever actually interact with the poor and invite somebody who's broken and hurting actually into my home to share at my table? You know, and it's, it's very easy for us to be comfortable with one another, to keep ourselves under that basket. But actually, this, the, the master said to the servant, you actually need to go out into those highways and into those hedges, into the streets, and you need to compel people. You know, these are people that will not come on their own because they don't think they're worthy. They don't think that God would ever accept them in their broken mess and in their estate. There are drug dealers on the street in Campbell River sitting there with no concept that God is moved with compassion to them and openly welcomes them. In fact, wants to compel them. That doesn't mean you stand them up and put them in an arm bar and drag them to church. It, but it means that we, we, there, we, there needs to be some zeal in bringing the gospel to people who need the gospel. Jesus came not for the righteous. It's not the, the, the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And he came not for the righteous, but for the, the sinner, the broken. That's the people who Jesus spent his time with. So this is going to be challenging and uncomfortable, but here's what 
I'm going to say. How many times, or how many opportunities have you had to actually open up your home, open up your life to somebody who's very messy, somebody who's uncomfortable, perhaps? I want to challenge us because I think that if we're going to follow in the footsteps of our master, Jesus, that it's going to look like we need to go and be among and love the poor as Jesus loved the poor and as he was moved in compassion. You know, when I was um, a number of years ago, Oh, sorry, I'm, I, if I get a little bit upset, I actually can't talk. You know, some people could just talk through it. I, I can't at all. So, um, but a number of years ago, I was in college, and uh, I, was, I was a brand new Christian. I was, uh, you know, I was, I was on the, the Christmas break. And uh, I'd finished my f- first semester that year, and, and I'd gone home. And I had an extremely unspiritual plan for those two weeks. I was going to veg out on the couch and watch TV and eat snacks and do nothing spiritual whatsoever. And, you know, again, I was like less than a year I've been a Christian, but it's like, this is my week off. I'm going to, you know, so I'm sitting in my house. And by the way, I lived in a pretty affluent neighborhood. It was a place called Burlington, Ontario. And uh, my dad, he made a lot of money. He was a vice president of a company. And uh, and so we, you know, we, he drove a Land Rover. We had a nice home. We lived in a wealthy part of town. And in the entire 25 years that I lived there, I don't think I ever once saw a homeless person or somebody who even looked disheveled. Like, I mean, our neighborhood was like everyone's put together probably nowadays it'd be like all lululemon and all that well anyway back then i'm in my house i'm vegging out on the couch at the middle of the day the doorbell rings so i go down to my my front door and i open the door and there's a man standing before me and he is so dirty and disheveled and his clothes are tattered and i think he had like cans on him or something and he's standing at my front door and i was so shocked because again it's been 20 years i lived there never ever seen a homeless guy wandering around here is not really the homeless part of town and so I, I looked at him and this is what he says to me he said would it be okay if i came inside and could you give me something to drink I, i'm not joking that's exactly what he said and i, I i'm thinking like who shows up to a random house and knocks on the door and says, could you please invite me inside for something to drink? Like it was just, it was so strange. I, I, I was just, I was kind of like, what is happening? I said, well, I guess so. But here's the thing, the unspiritual part is I was actually extremely annoyed because I had this plan to relax, watch TV, to do my own thing. And yet this kind of very uncomfortable person has now just invaded my home. And all of my comfort levels are now being totally offended. And this man comes upstairs. And I'm like, well, what would you like? And I, I can't remember. I think he wanted a coffee. And so I'm kind of like making coffee. I'm like, how, how long is this guy going to be here? <laughs> you know, my show is coming on. It's the kinds of things I'm thinking, totally unspiritual. And so I'm sitting with him. And I'm feeling kind of annoyed. And we talk about something for about 20 minutes. He, and it's nothing significant. And he just, you know, I said, well, how's your day going? Oh, fine. You know, stuff like that. And then finishes his coffee or whatever. I can't remember if it was a tea or a coffee, something like that. He finishes it. He says, well, thank you very much. I'm going to be on my way. And he gets up and he goes down through my house and he goes through the front door. And I'm absolutely confounded by this whole experience. I'm like, well, who is this guy? How did he get here? And, you know, and then I'm going to be honest here, this might freak some of you out, but the scripture verse comes to my mind, entertain strangers for by doing so you may be entertaining angels unawares. So I open up the door. I said, no, this is it. So I open up the door and I look down the street and it was a long street. And in the two or three seconds that I'd closed the door to when I got outside, the guy completely vanished. I actually looked down the street over here, the street this way. It would have taken 10 minutes to walk to the end of those and there was no sign of this man. Now, I don't know if that means that it was, by the way, it's a biblical thing. I didn't like, for those of you are like, what are you talking about? Angels trip? No, read Hebrews 13. Very clearly it states that sometimes angels disguise themselves among us we entertain strangers, and we don't even know it, but we're entertaining angels. And I, I wonder to this day if that, in fact, was one of those moments. And you know what it did to me? It radically offended my own sense of my own entitlements, my own comfort levels. And, and I, I felt, that, you know, in the midst of that, God says, you know, look how annoyed you were. Look how frustrated you were that this man, who is the poor of the earth, who's the kind of person that Jesus sent his servant to, to compel to his banquet, 
Oh, I'm so grieved by that. Like, you know, my heart was just, I was so offended. I didn't want this man messing up my, my life and my plans and my comfort. And yet I think it was actually something that God had sovereignly and divinely orchestrated so that he would break something in me to realize that, no, when we're Christians, we're God's church, this is the kinds of things, these are the kinds of people we're called to. We're called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus who hung around the sinner and the tax collector. So I want to challenge you this morning. Is there some way that you can open your door? Is there some way that you can put an extra chair or a place setting at your table? Is there people in your life that you could actually share? Not just, you know what? It's not even just, sometimes we treat those people like, oh, here, you know, a homeless guy comes, oh, let me just give them five bucks to get rid of them. I remember the story from Jim Simbley. He's in church one time. This homeless man comes up, and Jim Simbley, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, he says, oh, boy, here we go. He's like, what do you need? I got five bucks in my wallet. And the man says, I don't want your money, preacher. I want that Jesus you were talking about. You know, it's, it's not, we, we, we got to get over this idea that we just give them something and, and get them out of our way. We, but it's actually like invite, we need to invite these people to our tables. And so I want to close with this, uh, this, um, oh man, sorry, I'm getting just uh, really uh, stirred up by this right now. But I want to close, I, I you know, I found this uh, a book of Celtic prayers that I've been using. And my family and I have been praying this grace. It's called the Shabbat grace. It's one of these ancient Celtic graces. And I just want to read this to you. And this is what we've been praying at our table. And I want to challenge you to get a copy of this and pray the same prayer at your table. So when we give thanks, we say this. We say, bless, O Lord, this food we are about to eat. And we pray you, O God, that it may be good for our body and soul. And if there's any poor creature... <laughs> Hungry or thirsty, walking the road, may God send them into us so that we can share the food with them as Christ shares his gifts with all of us. Amen. So I, sorry, I'm just coming to unglued here a little bit. I apologize. But what, why don't you stand with me? Could we stand together? If that's comfortable for you, you can remain seated if you like. But I just would love to, to pray for us on this. And I'll hand it back over to Marie. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, as, as was said earlier today, uh, your words are spirit and they give life. Lord, we thank you for these, the events of Jesus which are preserved in the gospels for us. And Lord, we thank you for this incredibly challenging passage of scripture. Lord, will you challenge the sense that our religious merit has anything to do with us being invited to the kingdom of God? Lord, I'm praying for us as a church that, uh, number one, I pray for those who have not responded to the invitation of Jesus. And maybe that's family members we have. Maybe it's children. Maybe it's siblings. Maybe it's prodigals that we've been praying that would return. Lord, we ask you that they would respond to the invitation of Jesus to his banquet. Lord, we ask you that you would make us like the servant that is willing to go into those highways and byways and the places where the poor and the broken and the lame, the marginalized are, that we would compel them. We, we would, there would be an urgency in our hearts as we share the gospel with them. There would be a fervency in us as we pray for them, as we even willingly open our lives to them. Lord, I ask you that you would challenge us where we've kept our homes safe, where we've kept our homes comfortable. Would you challenge us that we might open our homes Put a new place at the table. Invite some of the people around us that may not be the most comfortable to have. Lord, would you change our hearts so that we would be more and more like Jesus who sat with the sinner and the tax collector and who said it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. So Lord, send us among those who are positioned. The circumstances of their lives are positioned for them to respond because you said in James 2, it isn't not the poor of the world that inherit the kingdom of God. And so Lord, we ask you that you would give us grace, that you would offend our comfort level, that you would allow us to live as Jesus lived. And so we, we, we thank you for all that you've said to us. Let your words remain in us. Anything that came from you, let it remain and let it become implanted. Let anything else that was not from you be forgotten. And we just, uh, we bless you. We praise you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.